Greetings one and all, Laszlo Montgomery here, coming to you, as always, via the China History Podcast. Glad you came back. Thanks for downloading this latest episode. I'm back from that Hong Kong trip and was home in Claremont all week. But as we speak, I'm now recording this in the great state of Texas from my downtown Dallas hotel room. We're leaving uh, ancient China behind for a while, and I was thinking today we'll start poking around the 20th century a little. I know we haven't looked at the Chinese Civil War and all that happened with the Japanese invasion and everything that went down during World War II. There are a lot of great topics yet to discuss, and of course, no small amount of tragedy and horrific violence from that time period, the late 30s through the 40s. So we'll look at that in the future. I know a lot of you have been asking about you know, when the Nanjing Massacre is going to be covered. Today we're just sort of jumping over all that and going straight for September, October 1949. And of course, Ray Harris will no doubt cover a lot of material about China and World War II in his History of World War II podcast. Today I thought we'd look at this tiny little sliver of history that happened over a period of about a year. I thought it might be Interesting to look at the first 12 months or so of the PRC's existence, those months just before and right after Mao stood on the podium at Tiananmen and told everyone assembled there on that historic day, October 1st, 1949, that the Chinese people had jan chi lai le, or stood up. Well, this is disputed that he said those exact words on that day, but the official version is that he said it. We all know a civil war was fought in China between the nationalists and the communists, and of course the communists prevailed and the nationalists went to Taiwan to regroup. This is probably common knowledge to any China History Podcast listener. Although the civil war sort of dragged on till 1950, by October 1949, it was all over, and the PRC was officially established And this, of course, was 62 years ago, just recently celebrated. Everyone in China got a week off to mark the event and at the same time provide some stimulus for the domestic economy. Even though we didn't discuss it in detail yet, or at all, come to think of it, the entirety of the period of the 1930s and the war years in China, everyone knows from Hollywood and Chinese cinema, if from nowhere else, that these were rather trying times in China. The end officially came in October 1949, but unofficially it was far from over. The southern part of China still had a lot of fighting going on. And suddenly Mao and the party leaders had to face the dilemma that strikes all great and successful revolutionaries. They had to face the reality of now what? Now that the war had been won, what do you do now? The Chinese communists were great, fighting in the hills and mountains and taking control of the countryside, but now they were in charge and on the world stage. So what do you do now? How to recreate China, get control of the government, the people, how to face the world, what do you do with Stalin, what do you do about Taiwan, everything else. If past history was any guide, they had to tread carefully lest they get swept away in those very volatile times. Mao knew he had two gargantuan tasks ahead of him. One was to build the political state and to shape society. The other grand problem was to get the economy going again. He caught a break in that the euphoria was such at first that it was easier than expected to establish control. All the famous stories of the polite and helpful PLA soldiers who were such a contrast to the smash-and-grab ways of the former warlord and later nationalist armies. And of course, compared to the Japanese, you know, after so many years of being pushed around, it wasn't surprising to hear some of the old stories from 1949. There was not only a sense of relief at the relative peace after so many years of war, there was this feeling in the air and all the four classes of society that maybe this just might work out. China was not in good shape in 1949. This was not going to be an easy task to build this nation. Rome wasn't built in a day, and neither was the PRC. Nonetheless, Mao had a plan. 
So let's swoop in and focus today on those exciting days in October 1949 and all the way through 1950 as the leaders who led the battle against the nationalist forces and won settled down, put their heads together as far as how to pull the nation up by the scruff of its neck and onto the path of world greatness. From January through the spring and summer of 1949, the PLA, People's Liberation Army, still around today, they just went on the rampage against the wilting Nationalist Army. The greatest military heroes in the history of the PRC all made their mark during these days. Zhu De, Peng De Huai, Lin Biao, Nie Rong Chen, Chen Yi, all the greats had their most glorious victories during this period. And they've all become immortal since then, although one of those in infamy, but that's for another day. Aside from all this military activity that was carried out brilliantly and heroically, there was an entire political aspect that was going on behind the scenes. It's easy to focus on all the battles and military exploits of all these great generals, but the reality was Mao and the top leaders knew when the last battle was won, They had to deal with a lot of things at once, so there was never any better time to plan than the present. The initial idea was to create a so-called united front. This is where Mao embraced all those who weren't committed to the communist cause by any means, but also didn't support the nationalists either. These were religious and intellectual leaders, as well as former KMT leaders who had long given up on the Chiang Kai-shek regime. You also had important overseas Chinese, PLA troops, minorities from the Hill Tribes, and elsewhere, and intellectuals. It was a nice, big, broad coalition. Many of you might have heard of this organization in China called the CPPCC. They're still around today. The Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference, also known in Chinese by its abbreviation, the Zhengxie, In all, at that first meeting, there were 662 delegates. The day after the meeting finished, the PRC was formally established on October 1st, 1949. But 10 days earlier, on September 21st, 1949, this August body held its first meeting in a room located in none other than the Forbidden City itself. If that didn't lend enough gravitas to the convocation, if you will... I don't know what else could. On September 27th, in the middle of this CPPCC meeting, the name of the city was restored from the current Beiping to its original name, Beijing, of which we know it today. Now, this all sounds easy, that everyone came together on this day to hold this 10-day meeting, but it wasn't this simple at all. You first had organizers from both the CCP and the United Front Bureau. Yeah, they created a bureau just to deal with this, organizing everybody and bringing them together with the CCP. The idea was to build all this unity at this crucial time of need and let everyone feel they had a piece of the new China. Before the fateful first CPPCC meeting, right before Liberation Day, everything had been all organized. Everyone who needed to be talked to got talked to and Since June of 1949, there was a committee already discussing the preparations for this big CPPCC meeting and creating an agenda, and Mao had to craft the new country's initial statement as to what they were going to say to the world to sort of kick the whole thing off. You know, talk about an exciting moment. And when I say there was a committee to draft this statement... The document really had already been vetted by Mao and the innermost circle of the CCP. The standing committee, by the way, at this time, consisted of five people. Mao, Zhou Enlai, Liu Shaoqi, Zhu De, and Chen Yun. The Central Committee at the time only had 44 members, and there were only 14 in the Politburo. It was during this time when the PLA were clearly going to be victorious, and no one doubted it any other way that all the leaders, big and small, all over China, some Communist Party members, some not members, everyone began discussing how to set up the new China. Constitutions were studied and all forms of government analyzed. They did it. These leaders who were 
There, at the very beginning when the new state was being built, they had to consider all these details and weigh all these options and discuss in all their little groups, just like they had to do in China in the late Qing dynasty. Now was their time to study these very same issues that Prince Gong, Li Hongzhang, and others you know, had faced much earlier. And they came up with what's known as the Common Program, the Gong Tong Gangling. This is what the whole month of September 1949 was all about, to churn out something like this. It was China's first rough constitution. And who was the man in charge? None other than Zhou Enlai himself. So you can see Zhou wasn't someone who sort of jumped on the bandwagon later. He was an original and remained one until his death in 1976. He was in charge, so of course the finished document was sure to be a well-polished and thought-out statement. And this whole thing, they pounded it out over 10 days, and boom, just like that, the new Chinese state, the backbone, the structure, basic laws and rights, and how everything and everyone interacted, the entirety of the system established by the KMT was abolished, and then it was out with the old and in with the new. And the euphoria in China, in some places, ran very high. That is, you know, depending on who you were, of course. But there was plenty of words written from eyewitnesses who claimed that there really was dancing in the streets in some places. To say the people and the nation were a little shell-shocked after nonstop war since, I guess, going back to 1927. I mean, who knew what to think? It, it, it sure looked good on the outside, and never was there more genuine period of comradeship between the party and the so-called United Front parties. In 1949, at this great moment of triumph, everyone got along and there was a, a feeling of optimism. So this common program, it contained 60 clauses and laid the whole thing out as far as how it was going to be from now on. And in the preface, it made clear to all the imperialist powers and the old guard where they stood as far as you know, how China was treated and who was responsible and how they viewed all that, you know, past treatment. Simultaneous to this founding document was Mao's famous essay, the Renmin Minju Zhuan Zheng, on the dictatorship of the people's democracy. This is where Mao really, you know, enhances his street cred as far as a founding father and guiding light of the party. This document came out June 30th, 1949. In this document that's, you know, also a founding document of the new nation, Mao gave his grand vision as far as what had happened and why the revolution was successful and where everything was going to go from here on out. This is where he basically says, you know, we can forget about Britain and the U.S. and the Western powers. Mao said China would remain neutral but would lean to one side, meaning towards their Soviet big brother, of course. And the common program, it had a nice aroma to it, because from the language, it sort of presumed that even if you weren't members of the party, you were still included in the deal. But in Mao's essay on the dictatorship of the people's democracy, the language wasn't so cuddly. That the CCP was in charge and would be the ultimate authority, power, controller of government, and have final say on all economic and social policy, foreign policy, I mean, the whole works. This was indisputable. Mao spelled it out clearly. The CCP, Chinese Communist Party, was in charge and made the decisions, and there was no wiggle room on that fact. The whole CPPCC back in 1949 I mean, that was necessary for window dressing purposes. You know, it's such a tender and delicate stage. The communists knew they needed these guys for the sake of stability and for any potential benefit tolerating them might offer. But make no mistake about it. The plan all along was old-fashioned, tried-and-tested Leninist centralism with the CCP at the center. And in these early days, any and all enemies were marked and quietly dealt with. Those formerly associated with the KMT were particularly marked for early handling. The CCP had been quietly keeping records and accounts since at least the mid-1920s. So right away you see the writing on the wall. 
the CPPCC is saying one thing and, you know, represents the thinking of a broad coalition and the CCP, that is Mao Zedong, saying they could have their say, but all that matters is what the party says. So while all this spirit of cooperation was being displayed on the outside, the CCP was moving very fast everywhere to establish their dictatorship. For most, this was a good thing, but for some, not such a good thing. Well, the day after Mao declared the founding of the PRC, the Soviet Union formally recognized the new communist regime. Recognition from Bulgaria, Romania, Poland, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, and Yugoslavia followed over the next few days. Chiang Kai-shek, by the way, was still in China. He didn't actually leave China until December 10th of 1949, so he held out as long as he could. The last holdouts resisting against the PLA were finished off by April of 1950. When the PRC was established, factory output was down 44% from 1937 levels. Food production in a land of 600 million people was only at subsistence level. Half the railroads built with all the foreign loans and the, were destroyed. Inflation had wrecked the economy and the currency. And even worse, there was a mass exodus of riches, treasures, and of course, people themselves were heading for the exits to begin their lives over in the major cities of Southeast Asia and of course, Taiwan and Hong Kong. There was a massive brain drain that happened during the closing days and months of the Republic of China. In fact, a crisis of sorts existed for the communist government in that there was a huge shortage of personnel who were qualified to act as officials. Of China's 600 million people at this time, 95% were involved in agriculture. And of that number, over 99% didn't belong to the party. So just imagine, if you will, the dynamic in China at the time, 1949-1950, and 1% was controlling the 99%. They had to beef up the party membership fast. At once, a massive campaign was initiated to bring more members to the party, and the ranks grew quickly. You needed a boatload of ganbu, or cadres, to execute the party's directives and all the nooks and crannies of the new PRC. China was simply too big, so growing the number of members to the party was an immediate priority and an important sidebar to everything else that was going on at the time. Now, just for a little context, the communists came to power October 1949, but good old Kim Il-sung is going to invade South Korea in June 1950, just eight months later, and China will get sucked in on October 19th of that same year. So in today's episode, we're specifically focusing on that period between October 1949, when the PRC is established, and October the following year as sort of a calm before the storm, if you will. The CCP seized power, and thanks to such fantastic organizing powers and talent where it counted, they were able to take control of the country and assert themselves and get the whole machine up and running. And then... October 19th, 1950, China's already at war with the USA on the soon-to-be-frozen Korean Peninsula. There was a blueprint in all as far as what Mao intended to do once they had control of the government. Mao had a lot of time in Jiangxi and Yan'an in the 30s to think all this through. But in all kinds of situations like this, they sort of made it up as they went along and improvised in a lot of cases. It wasn't all easy. Already, there were signs of differences between the elites in the party, who were the long marchers and the ones who had been in the party since the 20s, you know, and the newcomers who had joined the party in the 40s. The ones who came later were, you know, very high in enthusiasm, but without the street cred, you know, like I said. So it took time to build the party. The nationalists had fallen so quickly in the end. It was like when the Ming Dynasty fell, or even the Qing, one government fell and another one just walked into the empty shoes. There was none of these patented Chinese centuries of tumult and disunity in between dynasties. And it's right around now that China's world famous and fantastic propaganda machine started generating all those famous posters, 
many of us have seen, and a lot of the more famous revolutionary songs burst onto the scene. Everyone started calling each other comrade or tongzhi, which today you probably wouldn't want to use that word. The mythology of Chairman Mao began in earnest right about now. Starting from here, Mao Zedong began to acquire that supernatural aura about him, that something special that Mao had that Jiang Kai-shek was never quite able to achieve. The topmost membrane of the party leaders moved into Zhongnanhai. This is sort of a White House and Camp David sort of all rolled up into one. Its location is just adjacent to the western edge of the Forbidden City. Chairman Mao moved into the Hall of Beneficent Abundance, a pavilion originally built for the Qianlong Emperor. Ma was a passionate swimmer, so he ordered that a pool be built also. The number two guy in China at this time of liberation was Liu Shaoqi. We'll focus on Liu in a later podcast. He, of course, much later on would become the primary target of Mao's cultural revolution. But in those heady days of 1949-1950, right from the beginning, he became a practical voice of reason and tolerance to a certain extent. Inflation was dealt with effectively, and the refugee problem in all the major cities was handled by basically just sending the refugees and peasants back to their rural towns and villages. There are officially 56 minority peoples in China, and many of these were insisting and getting varying degrees of autonomy in return for their loyalties. And all kinds of public health campaigns were launched, and of course, they were always accompanied by prodigious amounts of propaganda, and it was easy to laugh at the simplicity of them, but these campaigns to do things like building latrines, cleaning up trash, teaching about public health, this wasn't as sexy as land reform or some other aspects of the revolution, but this kind of practical stuff was, you know, also going on. And when I say it was going on, that meant in the cities only. Rural China was going to have to wait, as they always did. The success of these early campaigns wasn't as great as the propaganda machine made it out to be, but it was a start. And it was also at this time that the Danwei came into being, the work unit. It's a little different today, of course, but back then, you were, for all intents and purposes, defined by your Danwei in society. Your Danwei said everything about you. And now it, too, was created and made part of the system of control being created by the party. Land reform was carried out, but this had already been going on since before liberation, wherever the communists you know, took control. Early land reform allowed the peasants to turn on the landlords. You had landlords, and you also had what was known as rich peasants. The rich peasants were critical to the ongoing stability of agriculture, so they were spared at first. Once the PRC was established, land reform was carried out more vigorously, and again, the earliest targets right out of the starting gate were the landlords. Dark days for them in the early 1950s. Roughly 40% of the cultivatable land in central South China, the heartland, had been seized from the landlords and handed out to peasants. In this early act, it said 60% of the population had some kind of benefit from this early land reform. The stories of land reform might make a good topic one day. Uh, And then, of course, women's rights had a field day. After 5,000 years, or however long, women were declared to be equal to their husbands. Polygamy was outlawed, as was the sale of girls. Female infanticide was also officially outlawed. And with all this newfound freedom, over a million women took advantage of the new divorce law. And women could hold land in their own names. I mean, these were earth-shattering events at the time. Seems so commonplace now. This was all nice, but women, you know, despite everything, they still had a glass ceiling and kept the role of providing all the heavy lifting and child-rearing and taking care of the home. The women of China weren't able to get too much relief in that respect, and it still remained their primary responsibility. If you were in the vice business, you were also an early target. Gambling, 
prostitution, corruption, all the big vices of the day felt the heat. Opium was still around, and this time, when the communist authorities moved in to have it wiped out, there was no opposing interests left to push back and sustain this century-old blight on the face of China. In December of 1949, Mao left China for the first time ever when he visited Moscow to attend a meeting of all the major dons of the communist world. On December 16th, he was warmly greeted at the Kremlin, but famously, after the welcome ceremony, it was all a game of brinksmanship between the two communist giants of the day, Stalin and Mao. Stalin pulled all his tricks and whatnot to diss Mao and make him uncomfortable and, in fact, just wasted his time. Not that Mao celebrated it at all, but when Christmas rolled around, he was still being toyed with and was not able to have a substantive meeting with Stalin until early January. And then finally, on February 14th, Valentine's Day no less, 1950, the Treaty of Friendship, Alliance, and Mutual Assistance was signed between China and Russia. This treaty basically said if China was attacked, the Soviet Union would come to their aid. Stalin also extended a $300 million loan, uh, half of which was uh, airmarked for military purposes. Stalin also committed to several dozen large-scale infrastructural projects. Every deal signed, every agreement entered into, saw the Chinese side getting the short end of the stick. And they were famously taken advantage of by their Soviet big brothers. And not very well known, because this looked so bad, the Soviets operating inside China after this treaty had the same old hated extraterritoriality that was, you know, one of the signature traits of the 19th century imperialist powers. But with the defeat of the ROC, the Republic of China, and the establishment of the PRC, Mao Zedong knew where his weaknesses were. I mean, let's face it, the West wasn't on his side. He knew that. In fact, it was well known that although the U.S. wouldn't go all the way to save Chiang Kai-shek's government, they were still firmly on the side of the nationalists. So Mao knew who his foes were and what friends he was stuck with. If he was going to rebuild China, the Soviets were going to be a necessary evil. So giving in to Stalin on several controversial one-sided demands was unavoidable given Mao's situation at the time. But this trip to Russia by Chairman Mao was the first foray for the new People's Republic onto the world stage. Mind you, it wasn't exactly the United Nations, but still, it was a major meeting of the communist world, and Mao was, other than Stalin, the big cheese of the moment. So it wasn't much of a grand entrance for Chairman Mao on the international stage, but in early 1950, the Cold War was really starting to get cold. In fact, 1950, it's already freezing, and all the lines are being drawn now. So in this world, in the communist world, Mao's visit to Moscow, end of 1949, beginning in 1950, certainly showed that he was now a much bigger fish in this communist pond. And although Stalin was clearly at the top of the food chain, Mao showed he wasn't bottom-feeding by any means. But still, history records that the quid pro quo, to keep Stalin's favor and get the Russians firmly behind them, Mao had to sort of give away the farm, or a portion of the farm. And then, while all this is going on and the party is fanning out to spread their control over everything, there was also the matter of securing Tibet, Xinjiang, and Inner Mongolia. Now, this, of course, took time, but nonetheless, it was a major issue that the new leaders had to deal with immediately as soon as they took control of the government. And we'll look at all the details of this uh, some other day. And not including the rectification campaign that happened at the conclusion of the Long March in the Yan'an period, in 1950, right after things settled down a bit, Mao launched the first one, the first of many to come. The first taste for everyone of that thing that one-party states are famous for. The first ones to get it, the lowest-hanging fruits on the tree of rightists, reactionaries, and 
counter-revolutionaries were the so-called active counter-revolutionaries, which was a fancy way for saying anyone formerly with the KMT or the Nationalist Army or anyone associated with Jiang's police and security apparatus. They got it first. And then to build up law and order and shore up the security of the party, Mao had a very capable person in Luo Ruiqing to get the whole state security apparatus in place, the Ministry of Public Security, the Gongan, and of course, Kang Sheng, who we discussed in a very early podcast last year. He was around too, proving very good at his job, as usual, running what was the party's secret police. And during a rectification campaign like this, when the net gets cast out, of course, you got a lot of smaller fish who also got put through the ringer and at best were exonerated or at worst executed. Zhou Enlai, by the way, was also one of the guys in charge of this first roundup of the usual suspects. In all, during the first 10 months of 1950, there were 13,812 arrests. All the procedures used to round everyone up and interrogate came right out of Joseph Stalin's playbook. And later on, at the end of 1950, when it was all done and Mao got the report, he gave everyone the thumbs up and he replied, quote, I received your comprehensive report on December 7th. It is excellent. Your policies are correct. Counter-revolutionary elements must be attacked firmly, surely, and ruthlessly so that no one at all has any doubt. And with those words, the stage was set for the next quarter century of Chinese history. From this early example of the Su Qing Fan Ge Ming Fan Zi Yun Dong, or Eliminate Counter-Revolutionary Elements Campaign, everyone began to get in line and the importance to genje dang de lu xian, or follow the party line, became sacrosanct. So today we focused our sights on that crucial first year of the PRC and got a sense of all the many things Mao had to deal with simultaneously. Of course, he had great people around him, Zhou Enlai, Liu Shaoqi, Deng Xiaoping, Chen Yun, Zhu De, and many others. But Mao, he was the decider. And ultimately, all decisions were left with him. So we can see he had a lot on his mind. 1949-1950 was just another stop along the way to where we are today with 21st century China. What began with all the national outrages we discussed in previous podcasts, from the Opium Wars to the Treaty of Versailles, May 4th, the founding of the Communist Party in 1921, Shanghai Massacre, Jiangxi, Soviet, the Long March, Yan'an, the Civil War. And then today we jumped into the fray and looked at that moment in time when the communist leaders knew victory was imminent and they had better start preparing for the big time. Today we saw how they sort of kicked things off with this you know, whole United Front thing, joining hands with all these strange bedfellows. Then you had the CPPCC, which still exists today, the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference. This led to the drafting of the Common Program, China's first constitution. Then Mao laid down the line with his essay on the dictatorship of the people's democracy. Then, during the first half of 1950, the PLA finishes off the last remnants of resistance, and it's all over. There's still Tibet, Xinjiang, and Inner Mongolia to deal with, but that comes later. And then a year after the founding of the PRC, China is fighting a war with the USA and Korea. That, of course, is an entirely different topic. But you can see China got a bit of a breather, but not for long. And then, of course, right after the Korean War ends, China starts riding the, the Chairman Mao roller coaster all the way to 1976. And in future China History Podcast topics, we'll jump inside that roller coaster and ride all the ups and downs of the 50s, 60s, and 70s. So I hope that gave you somewhat of an idea what the big picture was in China at the moment of the founding of the People's Republic. Mao and the new leaders of China had quite a handful to deal with. The next episode of the China History Podcast is going to be iffy at best. I'm leaving soon on one of these China trips where I'm sort of 
going to be on the move a lot. So if you notice episode number 62 coming a little bit later than usual, you'll know why. And so, my erudite listeners, from downtown Dallas, Texas, yes, of John F. Kennedy assassination fame, as well as the Dallas Cowboys, Texas Rangers, and the NBA world champion Dallas Mavericks, this is Laszlo Montgomery wishing everyone a fond farewell. And I'm filled with the usual wishful thinking that you'll join me next week for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.